good afternoon. Let's try that one more time. Like, I know it's afternoon, it's after lunch, and the event's almost over. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, that is way better. Um, I'm Karen Habercorn, and I lead product management for AWS Identity. And today we're going to look at a foundation of identity solutions in AWS. And I'd like to say that word again, foundation. Uh, if you are already an identity expert, and you've already been going to a bunch of really fun deep dive sessions, this may not be the session for you. Um, I think I think these flight attendants usually say the exits are to the back and to the sides. So I will not be offended if this is the wrong level of content for you. I was chatting with some folks beforehand about how this is our inaugural reinforce. We are super excited to be here with all of you. And part of what we're doing is figuring out the kinds of content we should offer. And so your feedback at the end will also be really, really valuable. So let's go ahead and get started. What we're going to talk about today are the choices that you make as you answer the fundamental question of identity governance, which is who can access what under what conditions? It's actually a really simple question. That question hasn't changed even since before the cloud. You start with the who. These are the identities you're trying to manage. And then you need to apply the access policies that define what those identities can do. And then you define the resources to which they can apply those actions. It's, it's really a simple construct, and we use it to think about the pillars of products that we offer. Products that let you manage identities, products that let you manage access, and products that let you organize your resources. The main thing that's changed about this question as companies move to the cloud is not the question itself. That's the same. It's the scale at which you're trying to answer it. The number of identities you're managing increases rapidly as you adopt a cloud architecture, as does the number of resources as your environment grows. And then if you think about multiplying all the combinations of access you might need to actually achieve who can access what under what conditions, you end up with a large volume of identities, permissions, and resources. And we're here to help you manage that at scale. So we're going to adopt a metaphor to answer this question. And I would like to first give credit where credit's due. I borrowed this metaphor from Quint Van Diemen, who's an excellent AWS identity speaker. And if you've ever had a chance to hear him speak, I highly recommend it. Um, I also feel like it's kind of fair that I borrowed his cake metaphor, because cake is delicious. And because my mom had a dessert business when I was growing up, so I feel like I'm kind of an expert on cake, perhaps more of an expert on cake than I am on identity. But at any rate, we're going to use this metaphor because it helps us delineate the question, who has access to what, under what conditions, by the segments of audiences for whom you're trying to answer it. And when I talk to customers, I find this delineation really helps them think about the layers of their infrastructure and how they might answer the question with different solutions to achieve the results they're trying to achieve. When you start with the bottom layer, you're thinking about the builders, the developers in your organization who are trying to actually access APIs directly in AWS so they can build the solutions you need. Um, they might use the management console. They might use APIs directly. But regardless, they're actually interfacing directly with the services. The middle layer is the infrastructure layer. This layer is actually kind of unique, because not only are there humans trying to access this layer, those would be the operators who are tuning, deploying, and monitoring your infrastructure. But there's also the identities themselves of that infrastructure, the instances and the databases. So you can think of, it, think of it as identities for the infrastructure and identities of the infrastructure. And at the top level, you have your applications. The applications are the only layer that any of your end users inter interact with. They have no idea what's going on under the covers. And that's sort of your goal. Your goal is that they come into those applications and gain access to them in an easy way without having to be aware of what all the all the bolts or all the nuts underneath. So here's what the cake looks like with its three layers. And at this point, if I were really going back to my baking background as a kid, I would want there to be perfectly smooth, delineated layers with very nice, you know, nice icing or something in between. In practice, what I think you'll find is that the layers are not quite as distinct as they look in the picture. You'll find use cases where someone is acting as an operator today, but an end user tomorrow. Maybe they're a data analyst who first is setting up a new data source, but then after that, they're using a visual application to actually get insights into that data. So they're an operator one day and an end user the next. I still find the metaphor helpful, though. So even, you know, you can, you can start to quibble with it and say, it doesn't work in this use case, or it's not exactly right. But it's still helpful to think about how different solutions work at different layers, even if the exact individual cases don't map to it perfectly. All right, so now we've asked the question. And we have a handy metaphor we, we're going to use as we explore it. But I want to talk about what we hear from you, our customers, about how they need these solutions to work. 
we talk to a lot of central security teams and CISOs, and most of them tell us, yeah, we totally want the benefits of the cloud for our company. We want our developers to be able to move fast. We want uh, you know, the business to be agile. We want to be able to innovate quickly. But we're the security team. We're on the hook if anything were possibly to go wrong. We have to improve the security posture of our company over time. And we're under pressure to do it with a pretty lean central team. And when you put it up on a slide like this, it kind of looks like it has to be a trade-off. You know, after all, it's got a column of stuff on one side and a column of stuff on the other side. But that's not how we see it at all. I see that as sort of a false question. Our goal is that you can actually, don't laugh, have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> By, okay, laugh. All right, thank you. Um, because you should be able to help your company set up your identity foundation quickly, let the developers innovate as rapidly as they can, while it's simultaneously maintaining or even improving your security posture without having to think of it as a two-column decision where you're picking one column or the other. All right, so let's get started. Let's get started with that bottom layer of the cake. This is the one that where you're trying to get your builders and developers onto AWS at scale in an easy way for you to manage. These are some of the questions that you might start with. You might start with, they basically boil down to, how do I set up my AWS environment so that builders can build rapidly? and so that I can manage their access at scale. You might wonder, what's an AWS account? Why do all these people at this conference seem to think I need more than one of them? And if I really do need more, more than one of them, how many? And if it's gonna turn out to be a lot, how will I possibly govern them at scale, provide access to the right ones, to the right people, and keep my resources organized? We give you a couple constructs in AWS to help you with this journey, to help you organize your environment in a way that will make it easy for you to grant access and manage your identities. The fundamental unit is the account. Um, it's not your bank account. It's more like a resource container, a place where you can keep all your stuff with a really convenient isolation boundary that gives you an instant layer of security before you even start expanding into other security features you might have learned about here at the conference. Once you have those accounts, to take advantage of their security boundaries, you actually need to create m several of them, you know, one for each thing you want to isolate. So we give you AWS organizations to actually structure those accounts into a hierarchy and then centrally govern and manage your overall environment. But even if you're using the account boundary th to get isolation, you may find there are situations where you need to further subdivide your resources into smaller groups. Maybe you have one aspect of a workload that you want one team to manage, and you have another set of features or capabilities of that application you want another team to manage. Um, AWS Resource Groups lets you subgroup resources into those smaller groups that you can keep organized. The easiest way to do that is just to use tags. Tags are what you might think of as a key value pair. The key might be something like development stage, and the values might be dev, test, prod. And resource groups let you organize those resources based on the values of their tags. Like, I want to see all the resources that are tagged Project Blue for the stage of development, and that creates a natural grouping that you can then manipulate and operate on in a sort of convenient way without exploding your brain of trying to keep, in tra keep track of every single resource in your account. Um, tags are useful for other things. I'll just mention on the side, cost allocation, your, your accounts payable department will, will be happy to hear that. Um, and they're also useful for access control, which I'll touch on later. But while we're still talking about resource groups, I want to mention that tagging isn't the only way you can logically think of grouping resources. We've started to look at the other constructs in AWS that people naturally think of as groups and expose them as officially as resource groups. So today, for example, you can form an AWS resource group based on all the resources created by a CloudFormation stack. And that may be another natural way, especially if you use CloudFormation for a lot of automation, you may think of grouping. All right, so with these constructs, how do we actually use them in our environment? Let's start with AWS organizations. And I don't think it's a spoiler alert that we're going to be talking about several other services. We will be filling in this table as we go. And you can see that the table reflects that cake model we talked about, platform, infrastructure, applications. And we're starting at that platform level. Organizations is one of my favorite AWS services, and I think there are over 150 to choose from, but the thing I like about it is it lets you take the things that you want to do centrally in your organization and do them in one place. So many other AWS services are highly distributed, and that's great for individual development teams who want to each operate in their own workload, but you as the central security team want to be able to centralize. 
Among the most powerful features are the ability to actually govern access into to your AWS environment. You can set rules like, for this particular part of my organization, only allow them to operate in, maybe it's your European division, only allow them to operate in Frankfurt and Dublin, and don't let them launch resources in any other region. Or maybe you have a part of your organization that does a lot of data analysis, and they should be using Elastic MapReduce, but EMR is not appropriate for another group of accounts, and you want to deny it there. Those kinds of rules you can set at this aggregate level for your whole organization or for sections of it, giving you sort of a natural guardrail of permission or a national per permission boundary. AWS Organizations is also the place you organize your accounts into those logical groups, and it has a way to programmatically create them so you can expand your environment easily. It integrates with a ton of AWS services, the kinds that you want to manage centrally. We'll talk about that more in a second. And perhaps, again, for your accounts payable team, they paid your bill to get here, so they'll be happy to hear this. Pay one bill for all the, everything that's happening in all of those accounts. So it sounds great. Create lots of accounts. But we often ask, hear customers asking for advice, but what's the best way to organize them? The best way for you will depend on how you structure your company. So there is no one best way that applies to every single person in this room. But we do see one pattern that shows up quite frequently, which is to isolate accounts by workload. And not just by workload, but by workload by development stage. Because the access you might need in the development stage may be different than in the test stage, and certainly different than in the production stage. And then if you're operating globally, you can take that one step further by workload, by stage, by region. This is actually what we do internally at Amazon, and it's a pattern that we see a lot of our customers adopt as well. I'll say one more time, no one best way. If the way you think of your business is more by business group, those people over there, they're the ones who make the toasters, these people over here are the ones who make the microwave ovens, that's fine too. But it, the key thing is that it conforms to how you logically think of your organization and that you are able to take advantage of the isolation boundary. My boss, who leads the identity team, likes to say, if one person could be paged in the middle of the night and not be able to operate on some software, it doesn't belong in the same account. All right, so let's look at quickly at some of the services that are natively integrated with organizations. This is just a few of them, but they give you a highlights of some of the ways that you can really powerfully take advantage of central governance across an environment. My favorite example is the second one, CloudTrail. Hopefully lots of you are already using CloudTrail for logging. And one pain point we heard from customers was, oh, it wasn't on in one of my accounts. With the integration with organizations, you can now turn it on centrally, ensure all of your logs are going to a central location, and none of the accounts in your organization can turn it off. If some of those accounts still want to independently log so they can look at their logs, that's fine too. So you can end up with two layers, an account level layer for the operators in that account, and then your org level layer where you want to see everything. But you can ensure that you have that turned on. And you can do the same thing with everything from licenses to firewalls. And there are more fun examples coming soon. I want to quickly highlight two that launched just this week. You might have heard in the keynote about uh, I am Access Advisor. This is a tool that shows you the services that a particular account has last used. And you can use this data to say, hey, wait, if I granted permissions to use this to a particular account and they haven't used it in over a year, Perhaps it's time for me to tighten those permissions and get closer to that principle of least privilege. With the integration with organizations, you can ask that same question, but now you can ask it for a group of accounts, an organizational unit, or even for your organization as a whole, and look for places that you want to restrict permissions at a more aggregate level rather than having to do it account by account. The other capability that launched this week, which with a lot of Twitter applause, is service quotas. If you have ever experienced a limit in AWS, you know that you'd much rather know in advance that it's there so you can request an appropriate increase. And Service Quotas lets you do that. And its integration with organizations lets you set up a template. If you know that you, there's a canonical way you want to set up an account with a particular set of quota increases, you can apply that template to any new account you create programmatically, and those quota increases will be at, requested on your behalf automatically. Kind of cool. Another thing we launched earlier this week is AWS Control Tower, and this might be a great moment to disambiguate, because you may be thinking, wait a minute, Steve Schmidt said it's, AWS Control Tower is the best way to set up and govern a, a multi-account environment. How can these things both be true? And the answer is, they are both true. The, the great thing about Control Tower is it abstracts multiple AWS services at a higher level, including AWS organizations. 
So when the control tower creates an automated landing zone following best practices of all the thousands of enterprises we've worked with, what it's actually doing is orchestrating AWS organizations and setting up an organizational structure that we've learned works well for many customers. It sets up a shared services account, and then it sets up a, a set of accounts where you might operate workloads without you having to think through what the right pattern is for you. You can think of it as smart defaults. It does the same thing with guardrails. When it's setting up guardrails, what, you know, rules that we find from working with enterprises work well for many customers, what it's doing is orchestrating policies and organizations on your behalf. In fact, my favorite feature of Control Tower, because I'm kind of a fan of organizations, is it will show you the policy it's creating on your behalf. So you can actually kind of learn as you go and say, oh, if that's the policy it's creating, that gives me some ideas of different kinds of features I may want to put in place in the future. And finally, it gives you a dashboard so you get some visibility into the status and compliance of all of the accounts in your organization. I think Control Tower is best for customers who are setting up a new environment and who are looking for that best practice guidance of how to, of how to operate it. I also think it's a great learning tool. So if you're, even if you're a long existing AWS customer and have an environment already, because it walks you through the best practices, it may spark some ideas about how you may want to apply them to your existing environment, even if you aren't yet ready to move that all over into its, into its structure. But you always have the opportunity to use it at that orchestration layer or to dive into the individual services and use them directly. And that flexibility, it gives you a lot of options as you move forward in your cloud journey. All right, so we've got our environment set up. Now we need to grant some access. This is a really easy question to think about how to phrase, too. The harder part is answering it. You've got a whole bunch of cloud builders, and you want to strongly authenticate them and map them to a whole bunch of roles that lets them get access to only the appropriate accounts in your ever-growing AWS environment. So how do you do that in a simple way? That brings us to the next service I want to talk about, which is AWS Single Sign-On. How many of you are actually, have actually tried AWS SSO? Anybody? I see one couple. AWS SSO is a really cool service because it takes the job of trying to configure access to multiple accounts and centralizes it. It's integrated with organizations, so it's taking advantage of that feature that you can actually think about your whole environment and manage it in a central way. It gives you some flexibility about the kinds of identities you may want to use, with either from an external source or, or created directly in a cloud-native way. And it not only gets you to the AWS accounts you need in your environment, but it gets end users to the business applications they need. And business applications could be a bit of a misnomer. You may get your developers to the development tools they, want, they need, too, perhaps ones they're using from our partner network. I mentioned that it gives you a choice of identity store. One of the choices is to use identities from your existing corporate directory. Perhaps you have Active Directory on-premise, like so many Fortune 500 companies do. Um, or perhaps you're ready to create um, identities directly in the cloud, in which case you can create users and groups directly within it. That flexibility also gives you a bunch of paths to how you move forward depending on where your identities are stored today. And here's how it works. You start in the master account, or the root account of your organizational tree. And then you retrieve the account structure from AWS organizations so that you, under, so that you have the sort of whole view of what, you, what your environment looks like. And from there, you define some permissions, which we call permission sets. It's just using standard syntax for AWS syntax for permissions, or you can use a library of permissions that we offer, or man, a, managed, a set of managed policies. And from there, you, def, you identify which accounts you want those permissions to be deployed into, and we take care of all the plumbing we automatically propagate all those permissions into the accounts that you designate. And then we take the identities you either linked in from your corporate directory or the ones you created natively in AWS SO, and you, you tell us what to map to what, which of those identities should be mapped to which per permissions to which accounts, all in a central administrative interface without having to go into each account and do it yourself. Um, I find it a really convenient way to think about multi-account access, partly because you can actually see what you're doing. You can see the mapping from one to another. Once you do that, here's what happens for your users. They come to a user portal where they first start by authenticating, either against your corporate directory or, or for, with the identity you created for them in the tool. And from there, they can actually see the accounts and business applications that they can access. And if they click on a particular AWS account and one of the permission sets you assign to them, they can go straight into the management console or they can retrieve credentials to operate in the command line or, or via APIs. So it's all centralized for the user, too. But I glossed over something. 
I just was like, permission sets, sounds good. But what permissions should you give? This is a little bit of a dangerous thing to say at a security conference, don't tell anyone. But I don't think it's a great idea to try to achieve least privilege on the first day of a project. If you have ever walked up to a developer who is about to start a project and asked them precisely which components and services are you going to use in your application, you will get a blank stare or possibly a kick. Because they don't know that's actually the idea. The whole idea is they're going to go try something. They're going to prototype. They're going to do a proof of concept. Maybe they have three different data stores in mind, and they're not quite sure which is going to be most efficient for their application. So if you start out as the security team saying, I have to have least privilege on day one, what you're doing is preventing those developers from experimenting. You're preventing them from actually trying out things before they know what they need. If you think of it as a journey instead, what happens is, is as they experiment, they'll sort of discard some stuff. Well, that didn't work. That proof of concept wasn't a good fit for my need. And over time, you'll see that the access they actually need will narrow. And, and that's your journey. Your journey as the workload settles is to then say, now I can actually refine the permissions because I have a much better idea, and the developer has a much better idea of what they're actually going to need. One way you can think about starting that is starting with some of the policies that we just offer you out of the box. We have a whole library of managed policies, and some of them are specific to job role. Like, what are the permissions we often hear from customers someone in their company needs if they're a network administrator? Or which are the ones they need if they're a database administrator? You may find over time that those permissions are not your exact use case, but it's a great place to start. It means you don't have to think about it up front. And then as you learn more about how the permissions are going to evolve for your particular company's needs or a particular team within your company's needs, you can get to the completely tricked out custom application that lets you have exact permissions you need for your use case. And you might wonder, no, you wouldn't wonder because you're at a security conference, what service do I use for that? You use AWS Identity and Access Management, otherwise known as IAM. This might be a moment for some disambiguation. IAM is both a industry term and for us a product name. Don't let that confuse you. We're talking broadly about identity and access management. We're also talking about the specific AWS service where you manage your permissions. If you're using AWS, you are using AWS IAM, even if you don't know it. Every single API in AWS is authenticated and authorized by AWS IAM. It has among the finest grain permission controls that you could possibly find, certainly that you can find from cloud providers, that let you fine tune your permission policies down to particular conditions and resources that you want to grant. And you do so in a canonical policy form that we'll take a quick peek at in a minute. A benefit that some people don't focus on as much, but I think is really important, is that it has a construct called an IAM role that is effectively a vehicle for transmitting short-term credentials. If you're here at a security conference, you know that the great thing about short-term credentials is that they, they improve your security posture by protecting you against any possible access breach because they're about to expire. By default, a session in AWS is about an hour, and you can extend it to as much as 12 hours if you have a long-running workload. But either way, you're getting that instant protection of knowing that those credentials, even if they're leaked, won't last for long. All right. So you've probably seen this before, but here's your quick overview of what an IAM policy looks like. It's a JSON formatted doc, and it encapsulates this question we started with, who has access to what, under what conditions. The who is actually implicit. The typical IAM policy is attached to an identity. So whichever role or user you've attached it to is the who. That's the identity that's going to be able to take the actions. The can access is the action statements. In this particular policy, you can see that the actions are being able to attach or detach an EBS volume from an EC2 instance. And that's the what. The resource is an EC2 instance. The last piece is, place, yeah, the last piece is under what conditions. We cleverly called that conditions. And in this case, you can see that the only situation in which this identity can attach or detach an EBS volume is when that, the EC2 instance is tagged with a tag key department, and the department is development. Um, so this is a canonical policy that shows you the structure, and it also shows you how the structure breaks down into the question that we started with. I promised you I was going to come back to tags, and so I am going to briefly come back to how you can use tags for access control right now. The problem with this policy, this is the one we just looked at, except I highlighted the word development in orange, is what if you have EC2 instances for every department in your company? 
some development ones, some finance ones, some marketing ones, I don't know what departments, you have some legal ones, whatever departments you have in your company. Now you're creating however many copies of this policy because the actual value is hard-coded in the policy. You need a copy of this that says finance and a copy of this that says marketing. If you move to attribute-based access control, you take a different approach. Instead of defining the exact value letter by letter in the policy, you just say, I want to grant access when the tag on the resource matches the tag on the identity. That's what this particular policy does. Resource tag defines what's the tag that's on the resource, and principal tag defines the tag that's on the identity, and it grants access only when the value of that department tag on both things matches. So if an identity in the development department tries to attach a volume to a EC2 instance that's in the development department, groovy, it's gonna work. But if someone from your finance department tries to attach a volume to an EC2 instance that's in your development department, access denied, and you did it all with one policy. This is a very scalable way to do permissions management, and if you're intrigued, my colleague Bridget Johnson is doing a repeat of, a repeat of her talk at five this afternoon, if you will still be awake and still raring to go. She is one of the most dynamic speakers in AWS, and so I highly encourage it. All right, there's one more IAM feature I wanted to mention, which is that it supports SAML Federation. And the reason I wanted to mention this is it is the same thing we were talking about before with AWS SSO, where you want to be able to connect to identities from any source, except in this particular case, it's connecting to a SAML compliant identity provider. Perhaps you're using Google identities or uh, Microsoft Azure Active Directory identities, or you're using Okta or you're using Ping. There's so many SAML identity providers out there. Um, at this precise moment, if that's the kind of identity provider you're using, setting it up in IAM is the best way to go. Just yesterday, you, you may not have known that you had a choice of conferences this week. There's an, a cloud identity conference in Washington, D.C. this week. And just yesterday, some of my colleagues demonstrated using AWS SO, federating Google identities into AWS SO with a new proposed standard called FastFed, which is quite exciting. But at this precise moment, that's a demo stage, not a production stage. And if you want to use a SAML, a SAML-based identity provider, you should use the IAM method. Because it's a bit of an assembly-level feature, I included the link here to a workshop if you want to do a step-by-step -step process of how to set it up. All right, so we've got your builders going. They are writing code like crazy. Everything's going great. And now you need to move to the middle layer of your cake, the infrastructure. At this point, you're thinking about operating systems, you're thinking about databases, how am I gonna centrally authenticate users into those operating systems to connect to those databases, uh, to even for the service accounts for your applications that are trying to act on those resources. And that brings us to AWS Directory Service. AWS Directory Service is actual Microsoft Active Directory in the cloud. And I say that because you may hear some other things that sound like Active Directory that are not actual Active Directory in the cloud. AWS has the highest fidelity implementation of Active Directory as a managed service. That makes it really easy for you to migrate workloads that are dependent on it that you may have been operating in your data center. When you set it up, it gives you access to the infrastructure just using the same directory credentials that you have on site and it gives you, your users a way to potentially access resources in a hybrid way, either, either that you may have still in your data center or that you may be ready to migrate to the cloud. And you don't have to sync the identity data to do it. And as I mentioned, this is a great migration path, especially if you have Windows or Linux-based workloads that you use Active Directory today. There is a ton of flexibility in how you set this up. Uh, one way is you can have your Active Directory domain on premise and an Active Directory, managed Active Directory domain in the AWS cloud, and then set up a trust between the two of them. Once you do that, your users can actually access resources in either domain seamlessly. Um, but another option is that you can just set up at what we call AD Connector, which will then set up, is a, basically a proxy for directory requests back to your on-premises directory. Or, as a customer I talked to this morning does, you can set up AWS managed Active Directory as a standalone directory just to create users in the cloud. Let me show you one example of how this works. It's kind of small print, but hopefully the, hopefully the walkthrough will work here. On the left, you can see that's your corporate data center, and it has your existing Active Directory you may have been operating on-premise in it. And the red box is the AWS managed directory domain that you set up in AWS, and they've got a trust between them, so, you've done, you know, so the domains are actually linked through a, trust, a forest trust. 
You then take your AWS Managed Active Directory domain and domain join it to EC2 instances where you may be running Windows workloads or Linux as an operating system or to RDS for SQL Server where you may have similar ideas in mind. Once you've done that domain join, the users in your, with their corporate credentials, those operators, they can get straight to those infrastructure resources using their corporate credentials. Kind of awesome. Of course, the whole reason you were probably doing that is because you wanted to migrate applications, likely Windows applications, or you wanted to run a Windows application in the cloud, like perhaps SharePoint off the shelf. And this is where the cake layers start to get blurry because, hey, guess what? Those end users in your organization, they can get to those applications the exact same way the operators can get to the infrastructure with their corporate directory credentials. This model extends really seamlessly to a very large number of AWS native applications, whether it be Chime for communication, QuickSight for data analysis, and even to FSx, which is a managed file server in the cloud, and using the same users in your managed Active Directory domain to provision into those applications. Oh, and then those end users get there too. Always one more click in the build. All right, so we've seen how the operators get to your infrastructure. What about the identities of the infrastructure? These are questions like, hey, from my EC2 instances, how am I securely gonna connect to AWS APIs? And what about my database credentials? How will, I connect to relation how will my applications connect to relational databases? There are a bunch of existing patterns for doing this, and some of you may be using some of them. SSH is a pattern that worked in data centers years ago, and it works just as well in the cloud. But I want to talk about how you can use the same approach for your infrastructure identities as you do for your human identities. And that is, is that you can, when you start with your EC2 instance, you can just pave an IAM role right onto it. You actually don't have to do anything. We automatically deliver the AWS credentials onto that instance and then rotate them for you without you having to muck around with it yourself. Once you've done that, then your code can actually discover the credentials in the operating system you have on that instance. And you're, man you're all of a sudden managing it with the same IAM role access you were using for humans, except you're doing it for a physical machine. When your code retrieves that credential, it can then use it to access the AWS resources based on whatever permissions you, you included in the role on that instance. This is, I cannot say how awesome this is as a way to just reduce the number of things you have to think about, because if you're setting up IAM roles for humans and you're setting up IAM roles for machines, then you aren't having to think about one model for one and one model for the other. Oh, and it works with a bunch of other compute things too, like containers. Without walking through the whole build, I just wanted to show that by analogy, AWS Secrets Manager does the same thing, except instead of doing it for AWS credentials, it's doing it for arbitrary secrets, like database credentials, third-party API keys, and it's converting them just into short-term credentials as well by doing the rotation for you behind the scenes. There have been a bunch of great talks at this event about Secrets Manager, so if you didn't have a chance to catch one, you can perhaps catch a video to learn more about how it does it. But in principle, what you're trying to achieve, and I think it works pretty well is to think about it from a mental model standpoint, is short-term credentials everywhere. Short-term credentials for the humans so that they don't mess things up, for the machines so you don't have to worry about rotation, and even for these arbitrary secrets, so you don't have to worry about rotation for them either, and you enhance your security posture across the board. All right, so we have looked at layer zero. Layer one, we are ready for the top layer, those applications. And here is where I get, oh, nope, let's do some questions first. Your end users, how do they sign up? How do they sign in? How do they authenticate? How do they do that regardless of where they're, what identity they like to sign in with? Maybe they like to sign in with Facebook or sign in with Google or even sign in with login with Amazon. And then how do I control access to all the business applications that my employees need too? So those end users could be employees in your company, they could be your customers, they could be your partners. So there are a bunch of different situations you might have to think about here. And now is where I point out that I cheated. Somehow along the way, even though I claimed we were talking about the bottom two layers of the cake, I've been coloring in the top row too. Sorry. Um, but the reason I did that is because many of the approaches we've talked about are great ways for the end users who work for you, the employees in your company, to access not only a bottom layer, a middle layer, but also an application. For example, when we talked about AWS SSO, we said, hey, great, you can use it to get single sign-on to your AWS accounts but you can also use it to get single sign-on to your development tools. So you're operating at both that low layer and that top layer 
or maybe you want to get to a business application like Salesforce that supports that too. Regardless, the three circles we've colored in already, those are approaches that work best for the end users in your workforce. The last one I want to talk about is Amazon Cognito, which gives you a good way to ac provide access to a larger group of end users, your customers, your partners, people you've never met before. And here's how it works. It's a, basically a development toolkit that gives simple and secure user sign up and sign in for a web or mobile application you may want to offer to any of those audiences. It takes all the muck of having to manage sign up and sign in, like keeping track of the identities and the credentials and managing a sign up pipeline securely, and removes that so that you don't have to do that undifferentiated heavy lifting. It gives you a choice of identity support, really broad identity support, so that you can have access the broadest group of end users you might want to reach, and they can use whatever identities they have to get to your application. And it does that in a standards-based way, so it's, it's all that detail is abstracted for you. You don't have to worry about supporting that spec or that spec or that spec, SAML, OIDC. We do that for you. You're using a consistent API interface, and, and we're making that work for you. And on top of all that, it's giving you a set of advanced security features that make you feel even more confident about your authentication of those end users. For example, it has a form of ad adaptive authentic authentication where if an end user shows up at your application and something's different about their sign-in today, perhaps they are coming from a different IP address than they have the last 20 times they signed in, it will identify that and might prompt them for an additional factor to make sure they really are who they say they are. One more other cool thing about Cognito that I'll mention now is that it integrates well with two forms of AWS services. It integrates with API Gateway, and by integrating with API Gateway, you can think about not only do I need end users to get to my application, but I might need end users to get to certain APIs depending on who they are. Maybe you have a partner, and if they're in your gold program, they should be, get, be able to get to one API that offers loyalty benefits. But if they're a standard partner, they should only be, get, be able to get to basic features. By integrating with API Gateway, you can start to offer that differentiation. And then it does the same thing with application load balancer for the app itself that you may be managing. So let's see what that process looks like. Here's your really awesome web or mobile. I guess it's clearly a mobile app. It's on a phone. Uh, when a user comes to your application, they sign in, and they'll be authenticated against the Amazon Cognito user pool. The user pool is the directory of identities that are associated with your application. Cognito immediately says, hey, wait, what's the source of identity for this particular user? And either redirects or posts back to the identity provider that that user selected when they signed up. So if that person is using a SAML-based IDP, sends it there for authentication. If that person did log in with Facebook or log in with Google or log in with Amazon, it sends them back there supporting all those social identities. And once they get a t that, I that identity provider authenticates them, it sends a token back to Cognito. Now we know that the user is authenticated. And then that token can be provided back to the application, so the application knows that it has a valid user to work with. From there, that token can be used to directly access any of AWS's servers, serverless backends. You can see the token being passed to that backend so that you can operate with, you know, provide access there. Or you can exchange that token to get an AWS credential that you could use for calling AWS services if your application needs to do that directly. So you can imagine so you're sort of trading the Cognito user pool token for a standard Amazon SDS token, which then gets passed back to the application and can be used to directly call AWS services. One of the things I like about this diagram is it shows you the flexibility you have. You can see all the different forms of identity you're supporting, all the different kinds of AWS infrastructure that your application can use without you actually having to get into the specifics of the identity protocols. Oh, and there's always one more click in the build. All right, so let's wrap this up. We have looked at five different identity services, and we've tried to slice and dice them by whether they might be a solution you would use for the builders in your organization, the operators in your organization, or the end users that you're trying to satisfy, whether in your organization or outside of it. And you can kind of see as you look at it that there's some mix and match options here. You might adopt AWS single sign-on for your employees, but Amazon Cognito for the consumer application you want to build for the consumers of one of the services that your company offers. And that would be totally fine. I also want to circle back at this point to Control Tower, which I mentioned earlier. Control Tower abstracts a bunch of AWS services, and it actually abstracts 
four of these. It sits on top of organizations, single sign-on, identity and access management, and optionally on top of directory service if you want to use directories in an active directory, uh, identities in an active directory. To be fair, it, also, it doesn't only work on top of identity services. If you go to the, one of the config sessions, they'll tell you how control tower abstracts config to. But this is an identity session, so we're talking about identities. And I think you can see a theme here, which is that control tower is abstracting against all the services you might need for your workforce. And this is where you can start thinking about what is the right level for, your, for you and your company to operate. Do you actually want to get into each of these services individually and mix and match them? You may if you have really custom use cases or you like to get your hands dirty or you're already halfway through or any of those reasons. Or you may say, no, I'm actually at the beginning of my cloud journey. I want to set up a new environment. If I adopt Control Tower now, it will actually orchestrate these individual services for me as I need them. Both models are great. And I'd be happy to stay after for a few minutes and chat with those of you who are trying to figure out which one is right for me, which one is not right for me. The great thing is there's no one-way doors here. If you start with Control Tower today and then decide, you know, I really need to customize it more, then it comes out of the box. You can go into these individual services and actually start to orchestrate in more detail there. All right, so here's my contact information. I am happy to chat now and afterwards if you have questions about which identity solutions are right for you. And don't forget to fill out the magical survey. And don't forget to check out all the sessions that I mentioned, either in the two hours you have left of today or on, on YouTube afterwards. And thanks so much for your time.